Uh, Dr. Oloweiler is going to talk to us about travel medicine and the impact of COVID-19. Dr. Oloweiler is an infectious disease physician who enjoys solving, um, spending time with his patients and believes in the value of a careful history and physical exam over the use of technology. He is a, has a special interest in dermatology and the skin manifestations of disease and has kept a photographic library of interesting cases since 1996. He enjoys the wide breadth of the variety of infectious disease consultation and enjoys solving the puzzle of each individual's case. He has run a travel medicine service to provide information to people traveling since 1996. Dr. Olweiler attended Temple University Medical School and completed his residency at Reading Hospital Medical Center in Reading, Pennsylvania. He returned to Temple to complete an infectious disease fellowship and has been at BB Healthcare since 1996. He is married and has five children between the ages of six to 18, three girls and two boys. He enjoys photography, coaching Little League Baseball and music. He was a trumpet player throughout high school and has played the ukulele and is now learning how to play the guitar. So Dr. Oloweiler, if you want to bring your slides up, I'll put it over to you. Wow. Um, okay. Let me see if I can get this working now. Um, hmm. Now I'm going to have trouble finding how to share my screen. Okay. So let me do this. Share screen. I think two. Let's see. I hope, is that working? Can you see my screen? Looks great. I hope and you can see my mouse. Uh, yep. All righty. So, um, so this is the, the challenge I was given to talk about travel medicine. And I'll give a thanks to Stephen Epps, my pediatric ID colleague, good friend, um, who asked me to do this many months ago. And when he first asked me, I said, you got to be kidding. I'll put everybody to sleep. But he said, no, no, no. People really have a little interest in this. You got to talk about regular travel stuff. Um, you know, just, just do what you do every day. Don't just do COVID. So I said, okay. And then when the schedule came out and I saw I was put on right after lunch, I thought, oh, great. Now I've got to fight the topic coma and I've also got to fight the food coma. So let me see if I can keep everybody awake for this and I will do my best. I'm going to show you lots of slides. That's always my weakness that I do too many slides. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. Um, the outline's basically divided into to, uh, two parts here. Um, the first half is my approach to travel, travel medicine visit, which has very little to do with COVID. Uh, and then the second half is going to be discussing, you know, a few special questions that come up with travel in this era of COVID-19, particularly is the plane safe. And I think Dr. Weber uh, gave us a preview of, of that, and I would agree. So I'll keep you in suspense for that. Uh, is in terms of what I do in the office when a traveler comes in, uh, first of all, if you're going to see travel patients, you need some authoritative source, you know, uh, that you can rely on. And really since about 1994, when I was at Temple, um, one of my mentors, Bing Saw, was the fellow who ran the travel clinic, and he gave me my first yellow book. And I think they publish about every two years. Uh, it started off about $20, and now it's up to about $61, but that's still a really, really good deal. And it'll tell you everything you need to coach your travelers and give them good advice. Fortunately, as you can see up here, you can also access really all the same content. If you'd like to use the web instead, you can go to the CDC's travel website. And just if you just do a search for Yellow Book, you'll find that. Beyond that, I'll mention there are two really useful sources, I think. I happen to subscribe to Tropamed. Both of these bullet points here are subscription services. You pay a lot of money but they give you a lot more detailed information. For example, upon exactly which portion of Ecuador you have to prophylax malaria, et cetera, not just the whole country. So you can, they're often very worthwhile for me. The, the last bullet point here is something called Sherpa. If you're really interested in COVID-19 risks in travel, you can go look that one up. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. Um, so my, the way I've organized things historically in my mind is I have a three, five, four, two rule. And that's just my own method of keeping things straight. So what does that mean? Well, these are topics that I don't want to forget to discuss with my travel medicine visit patients when they come. It's just my mnemonic is there's, you know, I've got to address all these. Keep in mind that the people I'm seeing, they're almost all retired. They're 60 and above. Uh, they were all born and raised in the United States. So I'm really not ever giving primary uh, you know, series of polio or MMR vaccines. 
you know, I'm blessed that I don't have to really think about that. So I'm, I'm seeing US citizens that have all their childhood vaccines. And these are the things that I have to address. The three stands for three bugs that you get from mosquitoes, Japanese encephalitis, malaria, and yellow fever. There are five bugs you get by eating them, polio, hepatitis A, typhoid, cholera, and dysentery. And then there's four vaccines that I consider standard. I try to remember, these are vaccines that I consider good things to get whether you leave the country or not. And that would be tetanus, influenza, pneumococcus, and meningococcus. And finally, I come back to the two, which is before anybody leaves, I got to think, did I give them their two prescriptions? For most people, they need a prescription for malaria pills and for dysentery. We'll come to in a few minutes. Um, so with regard to the mosquito-borne uh, uh, infections that travelers need to protect themselves from, there are three main ones, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, and malaria. And these are things that you can prevent. Um, now, a few words on yellow fever. So of course, it's a very bad viral illness. There's several hundred thousand cases per year. And it is an infection that is restricted to areas of South America, um, as well as, I'm gonna move a window around here, there we go. Areas of South America, as well as Central Africa. Um, it's a very bad thing. Uh, you can see some of the symptoms I've written there. Case fatality rate is 15, 20, 30% some, some, in some reports up to 50%. There is a live vaccine that's highly effective. Um, and in fact, there's good medical data to show that if you get one vaccine, you're really good for life in terms of immunity. Despite that, most of the countries that require this vaccine will really require you to have a yellow fever card that's stamped and shows that you get a booster every 10 years. So the sort of legal requirement is every 10 years. The medical requirement is really you get one shot and you're pretty much done. Now, it is a live virus vaccine, so it's not something you can give to heavily immune compromised patients, uh, such as somebody with an uh, HIV infection, CD4 count less than 200 or CD4% less than 15%. I would not give it. Um, you know, a bone marrow uh, transplant patient, you, you cannot give this vaccine. But in a normal host, the occurrence of vaccine-related encephalitis is extremely rare. And I'm only aware of one case that has occurred in the United States since 1965. And the published risk is as estimated at something around one per 8 million doses. Now, how about malaria prevention? Let's spend some time on this because there are two new items to discuss with this. Um, you see the distribution of malaria. It's pretty much everywhere in the world that is a warmer temperature where mosquitoes can live. The yellow countries here are those that have sort of spotty areas of malaria coverage. And the orange ones are where basically in the entire country or state is, is uh, a malaria risk. There are six potential interventions for malaria prevention. And I'll first discuss GlaxoSmithKline's vaccine because I think this is really, really interesting. Um, people have been working for 20 or 30 years trying to develop a malaria vaccine. This is a recombinant protein-based vaccine. Um, it's undergone extensive study. You can see the data that I've shown in that graph. It actually published in New England Journal in 2011. But it was just as of October 6th of this year that the World Health Organization, through further data analysis, finally said, yeah, we recommend widespread use in Africa. So we'll be seeing that pretty soon, I expect. The vaccine protects only against falciparum malaria. And that's why it's really going to be an African issue, not so much a South American issue. Um, it's given as three doses intramuscular once a month. And the study here that I'm showing here showed a reduced incidence of clinical malaria, 55% uh, vaccine protective efficacy. When you looked at about uh, 14 months after the first dose, which would be close to a year after completion of the vaccine series. Children where it was shown to have a benefit are not really infants. They're children aged five to 17 months old. And there's some concern for febrile seizures. I think Dr. Miller addressed that earlier. You know, children can have seizures regardless of vaccine, but it, it's believed that this vaccine may carry risk somewhere in the range of one in a thousand doses. Um, it's not currently approved for use in the United States. And I'm not sure, we'll see if GSK ever pursues formal FDA approval, uh, because this is not something we're going to be able to use to replace malaria pills in the travelers. It, number one, because it's really not going to be useful outside Africa and maybe Papua New Guinea. Um, it, it does require three doses over three months and not many travelers see you with that much lead time to allow that. There's no current data in adults. And I just told you my population is basically all 60 and over. 
and it is only 55% protective. So we need something much better than that in efficacy when you have your routine traveler go to Kenya or to Kruger National Park in South Africa. So again, just to highlight, we're talking about falciparum malaria uh, against which the vaccine protects, and that is almost exclusively in Central Africa. If you look down here at Eastern Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, yes, they have falciparum. They also have a lot of VVAX. Um, but if I go to the next slide, I'll show you where VVAX malaria lives. And that's predominantly a South American and, and Indian idea. Remember Papua New Guinea, if I go back and forth, Papua New Guinea has the distinction of having both in very large quantities, but that's why uh, GSK is really gonna push this vaccine for Africa and the World Health Organization sees that as something that'd be great to give once you're five months old. Interestingly, it did not seem to be helpful when given to small infants less than five months. So that's probably not going to happen. Now with malaria medications, there are a variety of things available. Uh, to get right to the point, I'll tell you there's two really good ones right now. Atovacone proguanil, which has been around since 2002, and I've been giving that to everybody for the past 10 or 15 years for sure. Uh, there's a new player on the market that I'll show you in the next slide, and that pretty much for most people you're going to choose between those options. So I'll tell you a little about Atovacone proguanil. Um, it's, it's still a bit on the expensive side. Some people really don't like spending almost $2 per pill, even though they spend $10,000 for their airfare. They don't wanna spend $60 for a month's supply of this drug. Um, it's always been convenient because it has no side effects in real clinical practice. No one even has a burp if they take this medicine. They can take it you know, for one day before they start travel, take it once a day while they're in Africa, let's say, take it for seven days after, after they return. So it's a short in, short out kind of pill in contrast to, let's say, mefloquin, where you have to start two weeks before travel all the way to four weeks after you're done. So it has really been my workhorse for a long time. Doxycycline, I think, is a, is a poor second choice. It's much less expensive. It can also be taken once a day with food. The problem is you can take, you could start one day before travel. You have to take it a month after you return. And there are lots of dietary restrictions. If you're worried about absorption, you've got to avoid dairy products, calcium, magnesium, zinc, aluminum, iron. Uh, you've got to worry about antacids, things that can interfere with absorption of doxycycline. People, when they're on vacation, don't want to deal with those hassles. And then you always have to wonder when they're on African safari, are they going to have some phototoxic reaction or photosensitivity at least? And that can be somewhere on the order of 15% of patients. Um, very briefly, chloroquine is not something I really ever use. Um, in terms of chloroquine resistance, that is worldwide. The only place you'd consider using chloroquine would be west of the Panama Canal in Central America. So it's still a candidate there. It does have some advantages, it's very safe, it's very inexpensive, and you take one pill once a week. You start two weeks before travel, take it until four weeks after your travel, um, I, when I have prescribed it, I have nervously checked the G6PD before doing so, although I think it's accurate to say that primaquine is really the culprit in, with G6PD hemolysis, much more than chloroquine, but it's nice to show the lawyers that you thought of it and you check before the patient leaves. When they get malaria and have hemolysis, you don't want somebody saying it was your drug that caused hemolysis. So mefloquine is something that probably you just shouldn't give anybody under, except under the most strange circumstances like you know, renal failure or pregnancy, perhaps. Um, the problem here is, I'll get right to the point, uh, it's become notorious through the internet, probably much more notorious than it deserves. If you ask patients to say, oh, I don't want that psychiatric pill, because it has, there are very isolated reports where people have tried to commit suicide taking mefloquine. I actually prescribed mefloquine for probably the majority of 10 or 12 years routinely, and I never had anybody say anything except, you know, it really made my dreams weird. Vivid colors, loud noises, and that was about it. No fatigue, no psychiatric effects, no nothing. But nonetheless, it's become notorious for that. So it's really not used anymore when there's a much safer option. Atovacone proguanil uh, has really been the workhorse. But the newcomer to the party is tefenicline. There are two brand names currently approved. Uh, drug itself is approved first in July of 2018. Um, it is effective for prevention of all species of malaria, not, not just falciparum or VVAX, all of them. It does kill the liver phase of malaria. And that has an advantage because uh, in terms of the lead in and lead out, um, you can start with three doses once a day before you travel. Then you take 
one pill once a week while you're traveling. So if you had a six month travel, you could fit that number of pills in your pocket. After you return, you only have to take a single dose about one week after return. So it's a real fast in, fast out kind of drug. Um, approval, FDA approval is currently for, for use up to six months, but I'll show you on the next slide that it's probably safe and effective long after that. You absolutely have to rule out G6PD deficiency before you prescribe this. Currently, there's no advice on whether you can or can't use it in renal failure. I, I may have forgotten to mention that atovacone proguan, proguanol really should not be used. It's thought to be contraindicated with a creatinine clearance less than 30. Um, I'll mention there's some concern. Will it cause psychiatric side effects because it is a distant cousin of mefloquin? It's called an 8-aminoquinolin, just like mefloquin and these other drugs. But there is a good study which is going to be published in the next calendar year, sometime, maybe February, we'll see, in a journal I frequently read, the Travel Medicine and Infectious Disease Journal. This is a very helpful study where they enrolled 300 healthy volunteers in a split between San Francisco and Australia. Um, and the strength of the study is they did not exclude people for a history of psychiatric illness. So there were people with depression and, and psychosis. As long as it was well controlled, they were allowed into the study. And, rather frightening to see how common those diagnoses were, 40 or 50% of each group. Um, what they did was give tefenoquin 200 milligrams once a week to both groups for a total of 52 weeks. Unfortunately, about 30% of each group have lost the, lost the follow-up, but the, the side effect profile turned out to be very benign. There was one suicide attempt in each group and the investigators felt this was unrelated to drug. There's one attempt in the placebo group, one attempt in the treatment group. The treatment fellow had just broken up with a long-term relationship, had a, quote, considerable baseline psychiatric history. The conclusion of the investigators is that there is no apparent risk of neurologic harm within one year of taking this medicine. Um, so I think that's helpful. One thing I noticed in reading that report was, although nothing much happened uh, more commonly in tefenoquin than placebo, just nausea. And the other thing was, a corneal uh, defect called uh, cornea verticillata. So I had to call my one of my ophthalmology friends and say, what the heck is that? And I'll show you some pictures of that and describe what it is. But important to notice that this corneal abnormality is benign and it did not cause any patients to stop taking their treatment. It first can be visible three months into treatment and it goes away three months after you stop treatment in almost everybody. So I'll show you the next slide. What we're talking about is these very fine, you have to get close to your monitor to see these very fine gray, gray whorls and lines that you can see on a slit lamp exam of the cornea. It's actually, my ophthalmology friend tells me it's most commonly uh, associated with people who use amiodarone, but there are cancer chemotherapy drugs. There are other medications that can cause it too. And it is benign, some other um, photographs that can show you what these gray whorls and lines look like in a slit lamp examination. They're really kind of neat and interesting. Of course, you need one of these to see it. You cannot just see it with your flashlight and physical exam up close. Now I'll move on to Japanese encephalitis briefly. This is another virus transmitted by mosquito. The mosquito species is a Culex mosquito. It's not the Aedes aegypti that carries yellow fever. So these are night feeders. Um, has some very severe uh, clinical uh, abnormalities, headache, seizure. Although severe diseases, somewhat rare in one, over two, one out of 250 people it can absolutely go to the brain, cause frankencephalitis, where the mortality rate is then 30%, and survivors are often left with permanent sequelae like seizures and focal neurologic deficits. Um, you have to think about this any, on the infectious disease boards, they will, they will get you on this. Any traveler who's going to Southeast Asia, India, Indonesia, um, you, you really have to give this if they're going to be in a high-risk area for more than a month, uh, you'd give it for shorter durations if somebody has a, a clear risky behavior like college student going to Vietnam. I've had a few of these doing agricultural research or somebody says, I'm going to go to Vietnam and I'm going to be backpacking. Don't really know where I'm going. Well, that guy gets a Japanese encephalitis vaccine, even if it's only going to be two weeks of travel. But for any business traveler who's going for 10 days, staying in urban places only, you would not give this vaccine. Historically, we used to think this was a really bad character that would cause, we were in, in fellowship, we were taught this is, you really got to watch people for allergic effects. I think it turns out to be much more benign than we expected. In my 25 years, I've not seen any serious side effects, but admittedly, I've given a small number of, of these uh, vaccines. 
The normal dose is, is a half milliliter IM uh, one month apart, though there is FDA approval for an accelerated uh, dosing schedule one week apart if you're in a big rush. You should still complete the series one week before travel uh, for worry about allergic reactions that can occur several days after a dose. So onward to my number five, which is five bugs that you eat. And we'll go through these very quickly. You know, polio, where do you get polio? All these colored countries here. Rather frightening to think that there are still some countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, over here in red, where there's circulating wild type polio virus. That's this one. The orange countries are places where there's circulating vaccine derived polio virus. And the yellow countries are places where the CDC believes are at risk for having circulating vaccine derived polio. So for any of these colored in countries, you really should give a polio booster, assuming your patient is adult and had their routine childhood vaccines. You give them a single shot subcutaneously. It's one time as an adult, you do not have to do it again in five years when they go to Africa. It's one shot and done for adults. You don't want to forget about polio. The other bugs that you eat, you know, hepatitis A, I'm not really going to address that, except to say that it has been part of the routine childhood schedule since about 2006, I believe. So if your patients are 15 years and old and younger, they've already had this, but that's an excellent vaccine, very high efficacy, as mentioned early in this conference today, really no side effects, and two doses six months apart protects you for life. The update on typhoid vaccine is unfortunately for about the last year and a half, there has been no oral typhoid vaccine. We can't get it. There's a supply issue. Um, the oral vaccine is wonderful. People love taking pills, even though it can cause some diarrhea and nausea. Um, but after you take this series of pills, you're good for five years. The shots, unfortunately, although they give you quick immunity within two weeks, they have to be repeated with a shot every two years. And right now, that's where we are. We're thinking in the spring of 2022 or later, we may get our oral supply of typhoid vaccine again. Cholera is only a recent vaccine uh, approved in 2016. It's always been tough to get a, an effective cholera vaccine. And even this vaccine, although it's effective 90% protective efficacy at 10 days after your shot, after your oral dose, I'm sorry, it rapidly declines after that. And it's, there's no real data to show what happens three months after your vaccine dose. How long does immunity last? Um, it is a single, it's a suspension. You drink it down once and you're done. So people like that aspect. They don't like the price, which is about $300 and it's not covered by routine health insurance. We don't know if you ever have to boost this or not, but the point is rather moot right now. The vaccine likewise is not available because with the crash in travelers from COVID-19, there, there was not adequate orders. So the company temporarily shut down production. Now with regard to dysentery, Pretty much if you leave the country, you need a speech on dysentery because all the orange and dark red countries here have risk of travelers diarrhea. And you see the handout that I give to everybody that I see says right at the top, cook it, peel it yourself or don't eat it. I'm not gonna delay my talk to go into all the details of things I tell people, but here's the bottom line. Uh, all of the dysentery uh, entities we talk about have a fecal oral transmission. So you only get diarrhea by eating diarrhea. If you don't put the bug in your mouth, it's not going to make you sick. So you really have to stress some careful food and water precautions, eating foods that are basically cooked, fruits and vegetables, only if it's something you can remove the peel yourself. I definitely uh, harp on three separate things here in every visit, which is don't eat the ice cubes. Freezing doesn't kill any germ. It just preserves them so they can thaw out in your stomach. Uh, don't eat the salad because raw fruits and vegetables is a great way of acquiring traveler's diarrhea and, and many, many parasites. Um, and don't rinse your toothbrush onto the faucet. You want to use bottled water or uh, maybe club soda to wash your toothbrush. Traveler's diarrhea can be caused by a variety of bacteria, viruses, parasites. And it's one reason why I really do not recommend prophylactic antibiotics to travelers. Uh, even untreated illness usually goes away four or five days and almost everybody resolves in a week. But my simple recommendations are if you're traveling, make sure you have lots of loperamide. If you get runny stools, you follow the instructions on the box. And I tell people, if you really got a dysentery bug, it may not be until day three or so of your diarrhea when you might notice a fever, blood or pus in the stool. If that happens, number one, stop taking loperamide. Number two, do take an antibiotic and I make sure everybody has a prescription in case they need it. And for almost all areas of the world, I recommend using azithromycin. 
Um, you can debate that issue. Some people give ciprofloxacin. Uh, I personally don't prescribe rif rifaximin because it's only FDA approved for non-invasive E. coli. And if somebody has a fever 103 with blood in their stool, then I know they have an invasive pathogen. So I don't think this would be a good choice. So azithromycin is number one on my list. And you do not have to stop your statin medication if you're using azithromycin, but it's probably a good idea to tell people stop their atorvastatin, for example, if they're taking ciprofloxacin to avoid risk of rhabdomyolysis. Now, the four stands for the four so-called standard vaccines, and that would be tetanus, influenza, pneumococcus, and meningococcus. Just a quick reminder that if anybody is going to the meningitis belt of Africa for the months of December through June, those are the people where you need to make sure they have the meningococcus vaccine, and you redo that every five years. The two stands for my two prescriptions I gotta give people. We already addressed malaria as a topic and dysentery. Those are two prescriptions I send them out with. All the other vaccines can be done in my office. Now, with the topic of simultaneous vaccines, this was brought up earlier in one of the presentations. Uh, currently, it's not recommended that there be any waiting period between multiple vaccines. And I, I totally agree. We commonly give up to five, I'm sorry, up to six vaccines if we have to for our African travelers, for example, all at once. And I see all adults, rarely some children who are traveling too, but in adults, you can just put three in each shoulder. We separate them by an inch. You can do three in the opposite shoulder. And if there's a young child, you can use the, the vastus lateralis, the quadriceps muscles for your injections, but you do not have to wait. And let's say a month after a flu shot to get COVID, of course, you don't have to wait a month after COVID to give your yellow fever vaccine or any other live or inactivated vaccine. Now, I'll pause for a half a second here and move on to the second half of the talk. I'm running pretty well on time. This is COVID considerations for travel. I'm first gonna bring everything down to the, the clinical sphere here in the trenches to describe a story that I'll never forget. And this was my first patient with COVID-19 who we admitted on March 20. I saw him right in the emergency room uh, with nothing but, you know, uh, I think I had a, a set of glasses on and a, a regular surgical mask. <laughs> Uh, with a guy coughing and blowing all over my hair and everything else. We, didn't, we did not have uh, a really a complete knowledge of how this was transmitted at that point. Infection control practices were still being formulated. His story was very tragic. This was a very healthy 67 year old man without any traditional COVID risk factors, had no heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, no immune impairment at all. Um, he traveled because his wife convinced him to go to New York City, March 9th and March 10th to see a show. It was their wedding anniversary. Um, they both got sick. She recovered with a mild cough. She recovered about three days, he did not. Eight days after travel, he presents to the ER with cough, aches and fever, looked okay. Chest x-ray mildly abnormal was sent home. Two days later, comes back to the ER, short of breath, was put immediately on a non-rebreather at 100% FiO2. And here are those two chest x-rays on the left from March 18th which definitely has some abnormal interstitial markings, <clears throat> but he had good oxygenation at that point. And we had no, we had nothing good we could give him anyway. So he was sent home. Two days later returns, you can see, uh, unfortunately, a, a real uh, progressive worsening of his chest X-ray infiltrates. This was not CHF, his BNP was 89.2 and he had no cardiac history. A CAT scan, of course, is always much nicer to see. And he has these characteristics, scattered ground glass densities, uh, COVID notoriously causes, and this is at about the uh, mid chest, about the level of the heart. If you look in the apices, we see that these ground glass densities have become much more confluent. Six days after admission, he had some lab work showing a full blown cytokine storm. Uh, there was no guideline on how to treat these people at that point. So we took some good guesses based on some discussions through Temple University and some Chinese uh, physicians. And we actually did give high dose prednisone at that point, even though everyone recommended against it, we gave him tocolizumab. He had some hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, if you remember those days. Remdesivir was not yet available. Tragically, he went on a ventilator that same day. We had some initial improvement from the steroids, but he could not get off the ventilator in 18 days after admission, he died. Tragically, with his wife in full isolation garb, not able to hold his skin, hand skin to skin, uh, it was just an awful experience. I called her every day to give her updates and very, very sad. You can imagine the guilt that she's uh, riddled with even to this day 
thinking that she convinced him to travel and now she's lost her husband. And one of my points for that story is that a COVID death is not this. Um, it would be merciful if you were walking outside, suddenly got struck by lightning, boom, fall to the ground and, and lights out, you're done. That is not a COVID death. A COVID death is days or weeks of being stuck in the hospital on high flow oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, mask on top of that, hair blowing back, so noisy it's hard to talk to anybody. You've got a negative pressure device in the room making more noise. You've got spouse or family members oftentimes in the hospital at the same time that you can't visit. Family and relatives can't visit you because of um, policies at the hospital on visitors. And you die in relative isolation. It's a very, very sad thing to have to watch over and over and over again. The challenges, of course, uh, similar to our vaccine hesitancy talk, you have people who will say, it's a hoax. I don't have any risk factors. Well, neither did Mr. GM. He had no risk factors for complicated disease. I had several people say, well, I've got my own supply of zinc, vitamin D, and ivermectin. And if I get infection, I'll take care of business that way. And I don't want that vaccine for sure. Well, much like the space shuttle, you know, everything's safe and seems like it's not real until it all of a sudden it happens to you. And now the risk isn't 3% or 0.3% of death. Now it's 100%. And it's very hard to convince some people of the need for vaccine to prevent things that I've seen over and over and over again, these tragic deaths. So when the patient comes to my office, they just want, they expect a five minute visit and they say, well, doc, what shots do I need? And I give them a 50 minute visit. And the first question is, you know, Mr. Jones, should you really be traveling at all? Uh, and I recognize just like the vaccine hesitancy challenges, I may tell somebody that I really shouldn't be traveling. I recognize they're probably not going to listen to me, but I'll put the seed in their mind. And at least I want them to know where the risks are, what things they can do to protect themselves. So with any travel associated pathogen, you wanna know what's the relative frequency of disease in your place of travel. So the CDC has a very nice website where they, which, which is updated constantly. And you can get different colors to show you which countries are high risk, low risk, you know, moderate risk and some uh, and the advice on whether you should travel there or not. Um, you have to identify the major medical risks in your patient as well. And those very common in my county, Sussex County, is there's 100% obesity. That's guaranteed. Very common lung disease. And almost everybody that lives in my county is certainly 60 and over. And many of them are 80 and over. So age is a big risk factor. You see the long list of risk factors for COVID-19 complications. And when I say complications, I mean hospitalization, ICU, ventilator, or death. I think age is a very big risk factor, but any kind of heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease puts you in a high risk category. Diabetes is a major risk factor. And my abbreviation down here, solid organ transplant or stem cell transplant. Uh, although fortunately we do not have many of those in our local population, uh, but that is a special risk category too. If you just look at the published data on obesity, you do see a typical nice J-shaped curve here. On the left axis, we have body mass index graphed against your adjusted risk ratio of death. And you can see compared to um, the normal body mass index, which is actually here, those that are the most obese have a twofold increased uh, risk ratio. Oddly enough, in this uh, 148,000 uh, patients collected, those who are just mildly overweight, which is me, actually had the lowest mortality. So it may be, may be okay just to have a couple of pounds extra, but not a lot extra. Um, much more important than that, of course, is age groups. So when you see a traveler and they're 60, 70, or 80 years old, you can tell them, you can show them this graph and tell them if you're, if you're 85, for example, you have almost a 570-fold increased risk of death as compared to somebody in the comparator group of 18 to 29. Now, this has given rise to what's called the COVID age tool, and I'm a big fan of. This, is, uh, this was made up by a, a bunch of uh, English investigators, been first published in May 2020, but it's updated constantly with all of their mortality data. And it works like this. You start off with your own age, um, say you're 50 years old, and that's your COVID age, and then you add or subtract years to your age based upon risk factors. So you can see here, if you're female, you get to take off five years. If you have hypertension, you can add a varying number of years, uh, possibly up to 12 years. Um, and if you have hematologic malignancy or solid organ transplant, you can add 10 or 12 years. Dialysis adds 13 years to your COVID age. 
And I'd encourage you to take a look at their website. It's really, it's really pretty nice. And you can, you can enter this for any one of your patients. And you enter, there's a series of little check marks, check marks you can uh, place in there and come up with a COVID age. For this example here, what I actually did was I, I suppose there was a 60 year old man, very well controlled diabetes, hemoglobin A1C less than 7%. He has hypertension, well managed. Uh, he has mild kidney disease with a GFR of 50. Well, it turns out his COVID age, he's 60 years old, and I would consider that a reasonably healthy man, his COVID age turns out to be 91. A COVID age of 91 places you in this very high risk category. Should you, should you acquire COVID, your risk of death is probably on the order of 10%, 10 out of 100, or 100 out of 1,000. So sometimes people see a number like that they can relate to, and that might help you with your discussions. Now, the issue of whether the plane's safe or not. Well, that has four components that I see. Number one, is the plane safe? It largely depends on where are you loading the plane from? Is it a place with a lot of activity? Number two, what's the window of infectivity? And from my brain, I usually think, well, in relation to symptoms, there's probably about two days before infection to about five days after infection when you're most infectious. And then your viral load excretion rapidly wanes after those five days. So you've gotta be there on the plane within that window period. And then people worry that, oh, I'm going to be stuck in this plane. It's a small volume of air. It's just stagnant. And that would be very dangerous if that were true. And then you wonder, is there anything the airline's doing to screen passengers that would help protect me? So um, I think it was Dr. Weber earlier mentioned that there are a very small number of reports where there are plane flights with any level of transmission, but certainly a smaller number where there's more than one transmission attributed to the plane flight itself. I'm only aware of four reports that occurred in the year 2020, and I'll show you characteristics on the next slide. These are very long flights that at the time really had no uniform uh, masking policy. There's a few other isolated reports, all with single transmission, but it comes out to be a very low number of transmitted secondary cases. Uh, briefly, I'll review this with you. The Cathay Airlines flight 811, you see these occurred, three of these occurred in March, 2020, when people were just getting accustomed to the COVID risk. Very large airliner, this will become important later, Boeing 777ER with up to 396 passengers, if full, 15 hour duration of flight. There were two primary infected people who boarded the flight and after 15 hours, they transmitted infection to two other people. Uh, Qantas flight 577, an Airbus 330, also a, a huge aircraft with 240 passenger, passengers. Five hour flight time, 11 people infected got on the plane, transmitted infection to 11 others. Vietnam Airlines Flight 54, a Boeing 787, 10 hour flight where one person was infected, but in fact, there were 15 secondary infections on that 10 hour flight. Emirates Air Flight 448 is also a Boeing 77 ER, huge aircraft, 18 hour flight during which a half hour of the trip, they were refueling in Indonesia, shut off the ventilation system for a half hour. There were two people with primary infection who got on the plane and they transmitted virus to five secondary contacts. So you can see from that that there's not a large number of secondary infections, especially considering these type of aircraft can hold 200, 300, or 400 people. And yet with a number of infected people getting on board, there's a small number of transmissions. So I'm only gonna show you two seat diagrams here. The first from Vietnam flight 54, where one index passenger got on shown here in red and with a 10 hour flight transmitted virus to probably 15 other people, 12 of whom were seated in orange here directly around her. It so happens that 11 of these 12 people in her business class seating section were within two rows of her. And this and lots of other data tells you that a very large risk factor for acquiring infection on a plane is who you're seated near. So within two rows, that's a risk factor. It's an important risk factor. Now, again, masks were not commonly used, and it's not actually known if this index patient used a mask at all during this travel. And my guess is she probably didn't. Um, another, uh, another seating diagram, which shows you somewhat of the opposite. In, in the previous slide, one person transmitted to 15 individuals. In this case, um, a five-hour flight from Singapore to Hangzhou, China. There were 15 people infected, shown with red triangles. And the result of a five hour flight was they transmitted virus to one secondary contact shown here in yellow. This unfortunate fellow was seated in a very safe place initially, but halfway through the flight, he decided to change his seat to chat with some friends. Unwittingly, 
with four COVID infected people directly around him. Like most cases, a mask use was optional, was not required. And this particular fellow who got infected did have a mask very loosely fitting, not covering his nose. Um, so very interesting. I think the point of that is to show you that transmission in a flight, even surrounded by infected people was not guaranteed. If I should go back and say, look at all these occupied seats shown by green dots. None of these people were infected despite being showered with 15 people that were actively infected at the time of the transport. Now, what about pre-flight testing? Is this helpful at all? Well, keep in mind that these are not stat tests done. These are not stat tests where you're walking up to get on your plane, they stick a thing in your nose, they look at it, you're positive, you're negative. That's not how it works. Um, it's a test that can be done anywhere from one, two, three, or four days before the flight. As of December 6th, uh, the CDC is going to require for any inbound flights into the United States that you have a test done one day prior to flight. I do not think they specify the type of tests. And I would guess that a lot of people are going to do antigen tests, which have a lower sensitivity than PCR. They'll probably do that because it's easier and quicker. Um, I'm going to argue that testing at any time will not pick up all those who are infectious. And a clue to that comes from this data. This is data by uh, Kuserka. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Um, it's a nice attempt to define the viral kinetics of infection. To answer the question, if I get infected, how long will it take me to have a positive PCR? Uh, it's dependent on many factors, but for the purpose of discussion, this paper assembled seven different studies where there was an absolute known time that somebody got exposed to COVID, There's an, uh, where they had daily PCR studies to find out exactly when their PCR turned positive, and then to know exactly when they became symptomatic. And what they found was in the first three days after contact with COVID, there's almost no utility of PCR testing. You can see here. By day four, you start to pick up some true positives. The false negative rate gets lower. At the time of typical symptom onset, which is about five days, you still have a very high false negative rate of testing. And by three days after symptom onset or eight days after contact, that was the nadir in their curve, which I'll show you in the next slide, that by eight days, here's contact at time zero, and here's day one, two, three, four, five. And even at day eight, three days after symptom onset, in this series, they never got a false negative rate lower than 20%. So if that's true, that means you cannot count on this test to absolutely exclude people who are infected. I think we know that testing alone is not the answer. I have seen a, a large number of people who had absolute classic chest x-rays, histories, exam findings, you know, CAT scan of the chest where we know they have COVID, yet their test is repeatedly negative and we treat them as COVID. Um, and uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide. My summary of the ported airline clusters is that, number one, there's very low transmission of COVID, even with those seated right next to an active case. Almost all the cases involve an absent masking policy. Um, these are all modern aircraft with, that did have HEPA filters installed, but a HEPA filter alone is not enough. And that convinces me that you really do need a mask if you're on an air, air, airline flight. All these are very long flights, five hours or more in duration. The Emirates Air flight was, I believe, 18 hours. The great majority of second cases are seated within two rows from any index case. Look at the dating of these reports. Almost, I mean, three out of the four occurred in around March 2020. Uh, the most recent report I'm aware of was September 2020. I'm not aware of any report of multiple transmission that has occurred in the calendar year of 2021. Now, if we look at reasons why, I think it's absolutely believable why the transmission rate is very low. Why? Because Planes since the 1990s have HEPA filters. Modern aircraft, large aircraft do. Small commuter aircraft may not. Remember that a HEPA filter it has a definition of a filter that can remove 99.97% of particles that are 0.3 microns in size. But I want to show you a detail on the next slide. That does not mean that particles less than 0.3 microns just slip through the filter. Nonetheless, if we believe that most transmission probably occurs by droplets, I know there's a debate on that. But if it occurs by droplets, droplets are often in the five to 10 micron range. They will be easily removed by HEPA filters. Even smaller droplets that may be important uh, for COVID transmission will be easily removed. The trick comes if you, if you really get a pure aerosol of virus alone, can a HEPA filter remove it? Um, the answer is yes, I'll show you on the next slide. But my bottom line here is that you're very unlikely to catch virus from anyone who's five rows away from you. You're not gonna catch virus from recirculated air in an aircraft that's going through a HEPA filter. You will catch virus from the guy that's 
seated right next to you if you have no precautions. Now, I can't get into all the complicated physics of this, but I'll show you uh, a graphic from a, a nice NASA paper. And if you're really into physics, you can read that and get very confused. But I wanna focus your attention on the blue line here, which shows the efficiency of particle removal by a HEPA filter. And what it, when people say, relate the 0 0.3 micron issue, what they're showing you here is the lowest efficiency of capture, which occurs at 0 0.3 microns. And it's a strange, uh, uh, strange feature of HEPA filters that when you go below 0.3 microns, the efficiency of particle removal actually increases. So that if you get here to the 0 0.1 micron level, like the size of a COVID virus, you're actually somewhere up around 99.999% uh, effective removal. So not true that if you're less than 0.3 microns, a HEPA filter will not clean the air. Now, also look at how often is the air going through these filters? Well, I'll compare to my hospital. In my hospital, if you're on AFB isolation or airborne isolation, or if you're in the operating room, we get 16 air changes per hour. The volume of air in the room is cycled through a HEPA filter 16 times per hour, something like once every four minutes. The CDC sets a standard that says you should have at a minimum 12 air changes. Standard hospital room is only six changes. Uh, that's a different CDC standard, by the way. Um, in, a, in a modern aircraft like the Airbus, Airbus and the Boeing 777, they get 12 to 15 air changes per hour. That's very much similar to what we would have in our operating rooms. How does the airflow work? Well, the air comes in through the top, sprays onto your face from that thing that you always have that I find very annoying, but you should leave those air vents open to allow the air to come in through the top, wash over your body with sort of layered airflow between the seats, and then it goes into air outlets, which are near the feet on the fuselage area. It goes underneath your feet to an air conditioning unit with a HEPA filter. It's filtered, then goes to an air mixing unit down below, or it's mixed with new air from the outside. And there's a mixture of about 40% recirculated air plus 60% outside air, which goes back to the top of your head to recirculate again. So um, that probably has a lot to do with why we don't, do not see large numbers of airline associated transmission. Now, the number of air filters in an Airbus 320 is two, Boeing 737 has two, a Boeing 787 has three. You can see a Boeing 777 has eight HEPA filters. Um, again, I'll remind people, open that top vent and just maybe put the annoying breeze away from your eyes and your face, but uh, just because it dries out my eyes, I don't like it. Now, are there numeric estimates of the risk that you can give somebody a number? There are. I removed a, a several slides for the point of this talk because I go way overboard. But I'll just mention this one study, um, maybe not surprisingly, it was written by members of the Boeing company, but it was a very detailed analysis. I think you'd be impressed if you actually try to read it. It's a mathematical analysis of the risk where they took into account from January through September 2020, 1 1.4 billion passengers on airlines. They found in just the literature review, 2,800 cases where there was an index passenger on board, 44 documented secondary cases, in 13 published reports with varying levels of mask use. For the purpose of this paper, all secondary cases were just considered to have happened on the airplane, even though that's probably not accurate. If you do all the math and put that together, they came up with a number that there's a risk that general worldwide traveler, all flights combined, the risk is one in 1.7 million passengers that you'll acquire COVID on your flight. They have a 95% or 95% credible interval. If you took the worst case scenario here, it would be one risk in 712,000 travelers, so very low risk. I'm gonna move on and have to accelerate here. What about temperature screening? Well, I think we ought to throw that away immediately. If you look at CDC data in the first part of 2020 of cases reported to the CDC, about 100, I'm sorry, about 370,000 cases, fever was present in only 43% of that cases. And that includes using a very liberal definition of fever, fever being defined as 38 degrees, or the mere report of subjective fever by the patient themselves. So if we accept subjective fever as counting, we get 43%. So if we, if we had only uh, objective documentation of fever, this number would be much lower. There is some data to support that idea. A small study of Swiss Army uh, military recruits um, who had uh, 84 military recruits who had COVID immediately after their onset of symptoms, they were diagnosed, had temperatures taken twice a day for two weeks, and it turned out that 83% of that population never had fever at all. Does that make any sense? Well, there's another cohort in Australia uh, where they just uh, assembled a group of 86 total people presenting to the hospital for testing. 88% of these were actually admitted to the hospital. 
And at the time of admission, only 19% had fever, defined again as 38 Celsius, and only 20% within the first 24 hours of admission. So fever is an insensitive marker. I do not think we should spend you know, $18 billion on body scanners for airports. What about leaving the middle seat empty? There are two interesting papers that uh, promoted the use of this. They're interesting to read and, and probably would be a good idea. The bottom line is I don't want to spend a lot of time reviewing it because uh, as of April 2021, there is no U.S. airline that will leave the middle seat open. They determined it's just not cost effective. They cannot keep their airline in business blocking off the middle seat. So what can you do? All these things are good. I think pre-flight testing has some value, but limited value if you know the characteristics of the tests. I think temperature screening is just not effective and should not be a place for public health dollars. Leaving the middle seat empty would be great, but probably not going to happen. What can you do before and during the flight? Well, the CDC does have an order in place that you are now required to wear a mask for the entire duration of travel on all public conveyances. So that means you know, planes, trains, automobiles, uh, any shuttle buses that make it to and from the, the plane flight itself. Also, regardless of vaccine status, you need a negative test on one day prior to travel if you're coming into the United States. Currently, the CDC order does not state that it's required for domestic travel, but they recommend a test one to three days before your trip. I think the airlines themselves uh, ha all have their own policy on what they demand in terms of testing. Uh, it's good advice to remain seated during your travel. Decrease physical contact with other people because contact transmission is a real problem as well. And we do not want to disturb the laminar airflow that goes from the ceiling to the floor. We don't want air mixing from front to back or back to front of the aircraft. We want to keep those top vents open so we maintain our laminar flow. And of course, good idea to carry hand sanitizer because we know virus can last on different types of surfaces, different durations, but up to three days in the reference that I've shown here. So in summary, is it safe to fly? Yes, it's definitely safer than uh, going to a restaurant. Am I going to fly? Absolutely not. <laughs> Why? Not because of COVID concerns, because it's not worth the hassle. Um, I can't go through all those requirements and everything. It's just not fun. So someday when it's fun again, maybe I'll get on an airplane, but I know I can get to a lot of fun places two or three hours with my car. So I have the luxury of not needing to fly. And as a couple of other speakers have said today, the airplane itself is probably not the risk, but this might be the risk. This is before you get on your flight, and this is after you've left your flight and you're coming back to the United States going through customs. By the way, that photo was taken in March 2020. Um, and it's whatever you're doing at your destination. This is a picture of people in Jamaica having a good old time. And that is obviously not a very safe environment to be in right now. Uh, beyond this, we have to know that your destination, if you're arranging travel, the destination may enforce their own set of requirements. And that's where this Sherpa website I mentioned, if you write that down, S-H-E-R-P-A, you can find it with a web search. I think it's a very useful tool. Uh, what they'll show you is a global map like this with colors on all the different countries that put countries in four different tiers of restrictions for travel. You know, question is, do they allow any travel at all? Uh, they can be open, re requiring no test or quarantine at all. They can require you to get a test uh, and enter the country if you're tested negative. They can require a test and then quarantine. Uh, and you can be quarantined for a day, a week, two weeks. Um, or they may be totally restricted where they're only allowing travel of returning citizens. Now, for fun, I entered this on December 4th. I said, what if I want to go to New Zealand? That's uh, usually been a place of low COVID activity. What would happen? Well, number one, you have to register for their managed isolation allocation system. Very scary. Uh, number two, secure and reserve your place in the isolation facility before you book your flights. Then you have to quarantine for seven days after you arrive. And then after you leave that quarantine, you've got to go to your place of residence, stay there for three more days and get another COVID test before you're allowed out of your own house. So pretty scary. Now, I do not know what their isolation facilities really look like, but I'm, I'm told by some other travelers, I'm told they're, they're quite nice. They have some indoor plumbing, they have toilet facilities. I think you get a good degree of privacy and they give you a nice view of the water. Of course, my weak attempt at some infectious disease humor, that's, uh, that's not New Zealand, that's Alcatraz uh, Island in San Francisco Bay. But what's been the effect of all this hassle, the worries, et cetera, on travel, you can see, each year, the millions and millions of flights that occurred 
up to 40, 40 million were predicted to occur in 2020. But in fact, how many flights did occur after COVID? Less than half that number. There's certainly rebound in the number of flights. And I believe I, there's data I deleted on domestic flights that shows we might be up to about 80% of our pre-COVID domestic travel right now. So very, the airlines are very much recovering. In summary, I'm gonna say it is a very bad time to open a travel medicine business. You are not gonna make money doing this. I never make money anyway, because I talk to every patient for 50 minutes before I give them their shots. I'm a talker. Um, there still is a knowledge gap. I think we wanna know what is really necessary for travelers. Like, yeah, HEPA filters, laminar airflow, masking policy on board, right on. What's too much? Probably temperature screening, not helpful. Use of an N95 mask and gloves for all passengers. I'd, I don't think I'd want to go there. What's of unclear benefit? Departure testing. I think there's definitely a benefit. It's, we just cannot believe that it's, you know, the public's perception, if you get a test and you're negative, you're good. And we know that that's not true. There's limited uh, value, but real value in testing. I believe planes are absolutely safe, but a mask is necessary, even though I hate them. The destinations, I said, are the real, are going to be the real problem for travelers. And do you really want to be in the center of Africa when you get short of breath with COVID? and need to be put on a ventilator. Uh, we don't know the quality of care at the location where you're traveling. I've given you a few updates on travel regarding malaria vaccine and the use of tefenoquine for, for malaria prevention. And with all that, I understand if nobody's really very interested in uh, travel outside the country, but I would suggest if you're looking where to go on your next trip, you might wanna come here. If you come down to Lewis, you'll get a nice view of the ocean there. You've got the Lewis Rehoboth Canal. And if it's anytime spring or summer, you'll see me out here on the ball field coaching uh, eight to 12 year olds. So uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'll let Dr. Smith determine if we have time for questions or I don't wanna uh, 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 croach upon the next speaker. No, I think we've got a couple a, a couple minutes. We can see they're, they're short questions. So maybe you'll have short answers, who knows. Um, the risk analysis that you were showing the one for age and risk factors, does that take the vaccine into account? Oh, you know, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know. I would have to look again at that, at that way. You can look yourself at that website. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't believe it does. Uh, I think that is, that's a calculated risk for non-vaccinated people. But again, I, I have to get back to you on that. Yeah. Sure, um, will your slides be available? Oh, oh, yes, for a small financial consideration, they're freely available. Just uh, send your checks, uh, ca no, cash only. No, of course, I'll, I'll make them available. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you've provided information on the use of masks. Do you also recommend eye protection for the general public, such as on a plane and or other higher risk exposures, such as enclosed places? Yeah, that's a great question. You know what? Um, I do not. Uh, and this, I think this is a matter of you know, the balancing act we've talked about with um, Dr. Hong, et cetera. Um, nobody has really made a statement that mandates that. So it's not a requirement on any aircraft. The CDC has not made an order to that. And I think until they do, I'm not going to wear, I don't wear goggles when I go to the grocery store. I think the level of risk I've shown you in an aircraft is so low that that's not, a, that's not uh, something you should do at all. Um, you, but I'm absolutely in favor of wearing masks. So I don't have any data to back that up. It's a great question. What percent of cases are acquired by virus entering the conjunctiva? Don't have an answer for you. I'm not aware of that data, but maybe one of the other speakers does know that answer. Yeah. Um, you've said you think travel by airplane is safe. All things considered, if you had a cross country flight, do you think it's safer to have two shorter hauls with a couple hour layovers or do it all in one go as a nonstop flight? Yeah, I would do the, I would definitely go uh, the nonstop flight. And one reason would be you're going to get a larger airline or you may get on one of those Airbus 320s or you may get a Boeing 787 or 777 with eight HEPA filters in it. So I'd like the larger aircraft that gives you a little more space, maybe better air filtration. There's no, the, the really short commuter flights are the ones where you're not really guaranteed about the HEPA filters. But of course, if you don't have a layover, then you don't have the area of real risk, which is the layover, not the plane. The plane is great. It's the layover where you're going to have mixing with it. You're going to sit down and lounge, have a drink, have a sandwich, and that's where you're going to acquire COVID. So skip the layover. Spend the extra money. <laughs> 
Um, could you comment on COVID risk on cruise ships, both large and the smaller ones with less than 150 passengers? Hmm. Uh, I can't give you any absolute data, you know, numerical data. It's hard to come by. Like, what, what's your risk? Is it one in 700,000 or is it something else? I don't know that answer. I think we absolutely know that transmission occurs. You know, there have been some large, well-published events where entire cruise liners were kept on quarantine, et cetera. So cannot give you any specifics, but it is a real risk. And I do not think it is a good time to do a cruise. You're on a contained, this is not a, a place where you have HEPA filters over your head. You know, I'd much rather be in an aircraft. I know that's safe on a cruise hundreds of people in close quarters. And I think I would put that in the, in the area of high risk. Though again, I don't have published data to look at for that. I, I put a big X over that one. Last question before we take a quick break. Um, is there a public health reason to avoid unnecessary travel during a pandemic? For example, does travel contribute to spread outbreaks, mutations, resistance, et cetera? Wow, I think Dr. Weber is going to answer that better than I can, for sure. Um, and I think Dr. Hong commented a little bit too. So um, I think absolutely there's potential, but I, I do not think the airline itself is the problem because um, uh, you've got a small window when somebody's actually going to be on the airplane contagious. I don't think people are, but regardless, there is, there's a non-zero risk that somebody's going to bring a new variant from any form of travel into the United States, I think that's unavoidable. Uh, so you can say, yes, it plays a role. Um, I got sidetracked, the transmission in airplanes not going to happen, but any means of travel, plane, train, automobile is going to help spread the virus. And I don't think there's much we can do to, to stop that. It's nice to make efforts to slow it down. Um, but again, I think you'll hear some more helpful information from Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Weber later. Yeah. All right, I agree. Um, thank you, Dr. Olweiler. 